Convergence is innovation, is it really? Well, at least in my mind, there are two kinds of innovations. That of mega stars, mega geniuses like Einstein and Newton, who could produce a new thing out of their mind, maybe like Einstein just sitting in a room, or like Newton, with a little trigger of an apple falling on his head and saying, oh, up, gravitation. Uh, by the way, we're lucky that Newton did not live in Africa. Think what could have happened if he sat under a coconut tree. But that's a different thing. I would call that kind of innovation uh, conceptual innovation. For us, more regular people, uh, with a will and drive and intelligence to innovate, our way of innovation is more adopting something that is known, mature, working in one area of science into another area of science, into one field of our life that is different from where it, we found it. And I term that contextual innovation, and contextual innovation is converging a solution from one area to another. Let me first start with a little question. You see an image here. Think of it, and then tell me, please, which one of the two images to its left and right it resembles more. Uh, I will not have you vote each one, keep it in your mind. And basically, if you were a bird, a cow, or even a monkey, you would select the one on the right, because image-wise, this is the thing that is similar, most similar to the central image. It, it has this uh, orange color blob, and a strawberry for a dress, and so on. If you're a human, and I believe most of you are, you have selected the right one, and why? Because we converge automatically, unconsciously, images into stories, and stories into images. And the image on the right, just like the one on the center, is an ugly little girl with uneven eyes and fallen teeth. All the story part, of the central image is identical with the right one and nothing to do with the left one. Keep that in mind, we'll get back to it at the end of this talk. I want to give you two examples of technological conversion that I was involved in. I got into the field of Stents. Stents are little tubes that have a special structure that when you expand them in a vessel that narrowed in the heart, expand it and keep it uh, expanded against narrowing again. All of my competitors uh, started from a little tube, asking engineers, how can you make for me a stent from this? Why? because they were already involved in vascular medicine, uh, blood vessels, and this is a world of tubes. This is called the law of instrument. Uh, namely, if you are facing a problem, you're most likely going to solve it with tools that you already know, with instruments that you already know. I came from Orbotech from a microelectronic industry, and I said, oh, it would be stupid to do it one by one from little tubes. Why not print it on a panel, multiple up, and have it much more efficient, efficiently made? And indeed, uh, 
if you look at that little uh, video that I'm now going to roll, you'll see on the uh, right side the way, sorry, your left, uh, the, uh, the way everybody else is making stents, and on the right side the way we make them. So, first of all, for just making it from the piece of metal, instead of making them one by one, I can make them 100 up on a panel. But then, when it comes to coating them with drug, instead of taking 10 minutes to coat a single stent, I'm coating 100 of them on a panel in one pass, and then, only then, I'm rolling it and welding it into a stent. This is a convergence of technology from microelectronics field into a medical device field. And the result of that, by the way, is that when we just started, we were more than tenfold more efficient in making them uh, cost-wise. Uh, and later, when the technology of everybody else caught up, we are still tenfold more effective because of the coating on a panel instead of a single stand. Next example, micro sensors. This is an area that we in medical device industry are going towards. Those are sensors that we want to implant in the body to sense some important physiological, biochemical uh, parameters that will let us monitor the activity of drugs or a device that we implanted and see if it's working, we need to change it, we need to change dosing, whatever. The size of that uh, sensor could make a big difference as to in what organs, in what spaces we can implant it. If it's too big, it won't fit into some of them. And what you see here is a friend of mine who used to be then the VP business development of a company called Medtronic, uh, Steve Osterley. And six years ago in TED Med, he bragged that his company, Medtronic, is now making sensors that are much smaller than the then existing art. And he showed that image on the uh, bottom left uh, with this existing sensor of another company, not much larger than a penny, and he then showed his own smaller than a penny. Keep that in mind, and here is a story that starts 40 years earlier. The Israeli Air Force, in years that I was part of it, we had problems. We had to fly, or at least make ourselves ready to fly, to far away targets, and we did not have GPS. Some of you don't know that there was a world before GPS, but there was one. And then the only way to navigate the navigation systems basically collected, integrated the speed and direction you're flying, and from that uh, decided or derived how far are you from the point of uh, start, and with that, tried to guess where we are. Systems like that, as you can imagine, integrate and collect error. They drift, is uh, how we call it. So what we wanted to do is to place some markers somewhere in the area on the way to the target, such that we will be able to locate them by the airplane, by the pilot, and correct the error that we have accumulated or else we would come to Iraq and have a 10 kilometer error, the target is not there. What you need in order to have those, you ha they have to be small enough such that uh, the enemy will not find them if they are in enemy territory, and they have to be passive so that you do not have to send people uh, twice a year to charge the battery. What we did is, we use devices like the one you see here on the right called, called Corner Cube, which, is, which has the uh, feature of wherever the energy is transmitted onto it, it will reflect it back exactly to the same direction because of the 
perpendicular orthogonal surfaces. Because of that, we could make very small aluminum things that phantoms with the radar would detect. And once they detect them, they can correct the error because they are in a known position. Small, passive. Now we go back to uh, my sensors. I said, what I need to do in order to implant them in spaces that the existing sensors, even the Medtronic one, cannot enter, is make them passive. That will allow me to make them small, because the energy pack of the active ones takes most of the space. So, when Steve Osterley visited me in Mednol, uh, what I showed him is this image of the same penny with his little device, and in the red bracket, my sensor, and you see it also on the left, I'm basically dotting the eye of the liberty on a penny. That allowed me to make sense, oh, by the way, this is the only existing sensors today to measure the uh, blood pressure in the artery that goes from the heart to the lungs, and they also show it next to a dime, and here is the size of my sensor that does the same thing, even at higher accuracy. That allows me to go into spaces like the ventricle of the brain in after operations and after uh, different disease. Or, for example, in glaucoma patients where we want to monitor continuously the pressure in the eyeball, you can see here at the bottom uh, my sensor uh, the way it's, it's sitting inside the eyeball, and you can imagine from the size of the uh, other sensors of that one, for example, it won't fit in the eye. Uh, the sensors, by the way, what you see at the bottom left here is six sensors implanted for half a year in the carotid artery, the artery that brings to the brain of a pig, and on the right, in blue, you see the pressure measured by them, and in black, a reference pressure, and you see the accuracy. Well, it's useful. It's good to be able to take something from an area you know where it's working and apply it to solve another uh, problem. Can you learn it? I believe yes. I believe reading that is unfortunately a declining, and I hope not dying, uh, performance for our kids and for us uh, is an unconscious and automatic five-fold conversion or uh, uh, transformation, if you will. We effortlessly converge lines into letters. We then converge letters into words. We then converge words into sentences. And when we read those sentences, we don't actually read the words, we see a sentence. And when we read sentences, we create a story. And once we created a story in our head, there goes this, the stable two-way conversion from a a uh, story to a picture, and back from a picture into a story, and we go back to our first slide, if you remember it. Uh, basically, even during sleep, during our dream, this is what we do. This is how we continue and train and maintain our nervous system, the, the, the strength of our synapses, the connections between nerve cells, by running our mind working. That's the main uh, uh, function of dreaming. Well, aside from that, reading and words are a very complicated and delicate code, and we learn to decipher codes. For example, you see two things. Are they different from each other? No, they are not. Are they now very different from each other? No. But with a little change, 
like that, suddenly they become very different, and automatically in your heads you have created a picture. Not necessarily green, not necessarily brown, but of very similar to what I've created here. This is a skill that we learn by learning a language, by learning to read, and of course it is uh, language uh, sensitive. It does, this one doesn't work in Hebrew, but in each language you'll have others. Here again you have things that are not very different from each other. You can, maybe now you can guess what it's going to turn into, but with this little change of moving it, suddenly we have two very distinct images created in our mind that are very different. This is a code, this is an important code. Back to our first uh, image. Basically, it's the story and the image that we have as an automatic conversion in our head. But if we are not going to keep our kids reading, we are going to let them just watch TV or videos on, on their uh, iPads or iPhones, th this is what they're left with. They skip all the other five steps that are very, very useful for training us. And this, if we think that we can have just five uh, points in mathematics and firing all our literature and history uh, uh, stuff in universities, we will be kept with along these two errors. We will not be able to invent anything useful. I do not believe that this is possible. And the last thing, just convergence can be also fun, not necessarily useful. And this is the story I'm going to end with my talk. 30 years ago, <coughs> I took uh, time off my duty as a pilot in the Air Force and went to Boston and became uh, dealt with my academic interest for three years. Suddenly I had time in my hands and I decided this is the time to learn to play some musical instrument. I wanted it for a long time, only I grew up in a kibbutz. There, if you want to learn uh, uh, some musical uh, instrument, they put on you an accordion and pretty soon you realize that while you're playing, everybody else is dancing with the nice little girls and you throw it away. So I started playing the flute and I was very, very disappointed with the sound I could produce. It was mainly hissing sound that comes from turbulence in the instrument and not what uh, James Galloway would produce or James Rampal. And being the uh, cocky, some people would say arrogant person I am, of course, I blame this floor for being uneven. Not me. It's not me, right? So I went immediately to see what is wrong with the flute. And applying my skills in, in aerodynamics, I went to the aerodynamics department and took the digital wind tunnel where you measure the behavior of wings and rudders and so on of airplanes and just built into it the, uh, a model of the head section of the flute and found out immediately where are uh, turbulence uh, created and started changing the structure until I reached a structure that minimized the, the turbulence. I bought three head sections from Yamaha and I started cutting it according to what I saw in the computer. Uh, came back to my weekly lesson and my uh, teacher asked me, Kobe, whatever happened to your sound? And I said, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> uh, she knew I'm not practicing. <laughs> And uh, so then I confessed to what I did, and she did, oh, it's fabulous, it's unbelievable, it's great. But you know, Americans, we are very sarcastic and cynical. They are much more generous in the way they uh, express 
uh, excitement. Uh, so I did not believe that. But a week later, she came with her Heinz flute, ten thousand dollar flute that is probably all her possession in in this world, and asked me to cut it. I did cut it. I did cut it for other flute players in the Boston Symphony. Here you see the patent that I wrote on this. And when Heinz asked me to uh, build health sections for them, I said only if it will carry the brand, the Richter scale head section, because Richter scale was not a good name attached with my family name, and I wanted a positive one. With that, I want to only summarize and say, I think we need to make sure we read. I think we need to make sure that our education system is multidisciplinary, not only engineering, not only because without that, you will lack the ability to converge from one discipline to another. Thank you.